Well, everybody, what's the crack? And welcome back to episode number 38 of the Inline G Flute Podcast with me, your host, motherfucking Inline G. Episode 38. Probably. I'm losing count around here, guys. Now, listen, I've just finished recording this episode. And I know I say this every time a guest comes on here, but I really mean it this time. This was genuinely one of my favorite ever episodes of Inline G. It is with a guest. It is Dr. Brian Little. She's an American flute player, professor, academic, and all-around superstar. Now, a lot of you guys on social media will probably know Brian. You'll see her name come up. She's also a big fan of Inline G, which is actually how we got to know each other. And it's so fun for me to have someone who's involved with the podcast and enjoys listening to it on it. We are building this community. I say it constantly. We are building the most empathetic, compassionate, and downright fucking hilarious corner of the flute world. And I mean it. We're all together in this now. With Brian, we focused on pretty much one subject, because it's a fucking unbelievable subject. Brian wrote her doctoral thesis on a flute concerto called uh, To Notice Such Things, and it was composed by a guy called John Lord. Now, John Lord, any rockers or any stoners amongst you will recognize that name. It is the same one. It is the keyboard player and founding member of Rock and Roll Hall of Fame band Deep Purple. Now, the concerto is fucking gorgeous. I'd never heard of it until Brienne brought it to my attention. She has worked tirelessly for the last few years to try and bring more exposure to this piece. And most of her pleas have fallen on deaf ears. So I'm thrilled to have her on talk about it. I love this episode. Um, and also, hearing Brienne talk so passionately about the piece, about its history, about the characters involved in it, and the litany of funny anecdotes around it, including, by the way, the first ever time I've had to beep a guest for a swear word on the podcast. Look out for it. But it's made this piece more lovable. So this episode was amazing fun. Skip to it now if you want to. It's about a minute away. Let me get the usual housekeeping out of the way. So, <clears throat> the Inline G podcast is free and will always be free. However, if you wish to donate to the podcast, you can now do so through the Patreon. It costs five euros or dollars or pounds or equivalent euro currency per month. And with that, you're keeping this podcast alive. I do everything around here on my own, including marketing, graphic design, research, scripts, audio production, video production, etc., etc., etc. Becoming a patron helps to generate regular income for this podcast, meaning I can turn down other work to focus on it. And it also allows me to travel to meet the best flute players in the world and ask them who their favorite Spice Girl is. Now, as a thank you, you get to ask questions to the best flute players who are coming on the podcast before anyone else, and you get episodes released to you before anyone else. If you can afford it, it is hugely appreciated, and it means the world to me. You can unsubscribe at any time instantly with no fee, no problems. If you can't afford it, that's grand. You can listen for free. So, guys, here is this week's episode with Dr. Brian Little. Now, first thing, as you know, the first thing I do ask all my guests is inline G or offset G. Okay, so I have a little bit of story about this, but I am on offset G. I'm on offset because I you're American. Because I I was injured when I was 19 years old. Ooh, and okay. I yeah, I have a pinched nerve that goes down the left side of my my body basically oh. into my left arm. Yeah, so I basically had to switch from inline to offset in order to play pain free. So that's why ah. I'm offset. So did you previously play in line and then you noticed the pain yes. coming in? Ah, shit. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Then, okay. Then I'll let you off of it. You get away <laughs> oh, with you. that one. You get away with that one. Do you prefer if I say Dr. Brian, Dr. Little, or can I refer casually no. to you as just Brian? You can, you can refer casually. It's totally fine. <gasps> this is why I, I use... don't have a doctor as well, because if I got one, I would insist on it. I do use in my teaching, I do use Dr. Little just because God. my name is mispronounced so often ah. <laughs> that, yeah, it's Very just clever. easier. Dr. Little is quite easy. So I use that a lot for teaching, but okay. we're friends. We're friends. Yeah, we, we can chill out together. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I would insist yeah. on it. But uh, doctorate then, what's your doctorate in? Flute, performance, pedagogy, and literature. Literature is in flute literature. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay and is that where is that where your thesis comes from that we're going to talk about today or is that your master's thesis no that's that's the doctoral thesis so that's kind ah, of where that okay. comes from yeah mm -hmm. oh, beautiful segue beautiful segue Perfect. well then on that actually I'm i was trying to think today why I even where you brought this to my attention i think i put up a video somewhere talking about favorite flute concertos and you commented going oh to notice such thing as my favorite and i was going what's that and he said oh it's uh, by uh, john lord the former keyboard player in Deep Purple. And I was like, excuse me? <laughs> he was like, oh, yeah. you're concerned by the guy from Deep Purple? And you're like, yeah, it's really fucking cool. And I was like, it is really cool. And you're like, oh yeah, I wrote my doctoral thesis. And I was like, man, 
then <laughs> on you come to the podcast perfect is that what that I, is what happened isn't it yeah that's what happened and i yeah. i heard about this piece like in the in the strangest way i was just driving somewhere i don't even remember where i was driving but i had the classical music radio station on in my car mm -hmm. um and this piece came on because it was recorded and so this must have been a, a year or two after it was recorded and i was like okay. oh my oh my god what is this piece i have to have this piece what is it and i looked it up it was not published at that point i don't know if it is published right now i have copies of it because i basically uh. worked with the publisher for my dissertation but i don't think it's actually published fully I don't oh know. wow okay so you couldn't even buy the flute part anywhere no you couldn't buy it so that just kind of happened that when i was trying to figure out what i was going to write my dissertation on i was like this piece is like the perfect length um if you're going to write about a piece of music for a dissertation it kind of has to be like you have to do a lecture recital along yeah. with the writing yeah. and so it was like you need about 30 minutes of playing and 30 minutes of speaking and this piece is about 27 28 minutes long yeah and i was like it happens to fit perfectly no Perfect. one that i know has ever heard of it like i yeah, yeah. i have to write about this and awesome it, i'm so glad yeah, you it just ended up when what? did you do your doctors when did you do your it, doctor thesis in uh when or where when when did you finish when it? um i graduated in 2016 so i was writing this okay. in 2015 2016. okay so it's not yeah okay it's not too old then good no. yeah because i noticed I, I deliberately picked out one line from this because it says uh we'll talk about what it is in a minute i've kind of went a long way around here but the listeners are used to this at this point um to notice such things is a substantial addition to the canon of significant flute music worthy of more frequent performance this paper intends to bring increased attention to a composer and writer whose talents and creative works deserve further recognition. And here we are. Now we're getting a podcast episode out of it. So it, it did. It, it served its purpose. Yay! You've at least got Yay! one new fan because I have listened to it. I've read the paper twice and I've listened to the like four or five times now. I've only listened to one. I don't know if there is more than one recording, but I've only listened to one. Is there only one recording then? Yeah. There's only one. Yeah. It is a good one though. So at least that's all right. Yeah, it is. It's um, very good. Also by an Irish flute player. I'll get to that later, but Cormac's oh. Irish. But anyway, uh, okay. So let's go back and circle around your doctor thesis. Tell us what it is. What's it about? Give us a quick blurb. A quick beginner's guide. So the, the doctoral thesis is basically the final thing that I had to do before I could graduate with my doctorate. And I decided that I wanted to do kind of a a deep dive into this piece. I'm personally more interested in the history and the relationships between the composer and the person that he's writing about. Um, but I also kind of had to do a theoretical deep dive mm -hmm. into it. So I had to analyze sections of it. I had to like compare sections of this piece to some of the improvisation that John Lord would do when he was mm -hmm. with Deep Purple. So I had to I had to get more academic about it than I really wanted to, but that was that was a job. That's what had to happen at that point. So Yeah, but, but it's, also it's quite fun to be doing a thesis and get like you have to listen to Deep Purple. Oh no, I have to go stick on Deep Purple. That was like the best part of writing this. I was like, oh, I got to go listen to some Deep Purple and try to transcribe <laughs> some solos. Oh, oh no. <laughs> that, that's so much fun. I've listened to a lot of Deep Purple because of this as well, because I wanted to get a bit more of an idea about it. But also, I just wanted to listen to Deep Purple. So yeah, it is a, we don't, we're not really calling this piece a flute concerto then, are we? Not officially a flute it's, concerto. It kind of is, but it, so it is a, a concerto but kind of more for two instruments so the flute and the piano are the really prominent instruments because mm -hmm. the flute is representing the person that this piece is about and dedicated to and that's john mortimer mm -hmm. and then the piano represents john lord himself so there's a lot yeah. of intertwining of the flute and piano solo parts and then it's yeah. accompanied by strings so i don't yeah i don't know if it would fall into concerto territory or like is it concerto yeah. grosso is it like a double concerto oh yeah I, yeah yeah, it's funny because yeah. I don't really know, because obviously there's concerto form, but right. we call things concertos nowadays that aren't in concerto form anymore. That's kind of went out the window. So it, it, for all intents and purposes, it is a concerto. I think it's officially called a suite, is it, for flute, piano and strings? Yes, I think that's what he calls it, because it has six movements in it as yeah. well. But it is like, so. yeah, it's concerto length and it's got the, the scale of a concerto 100%. So it's called yeah. To Notice Such Things and it's got it's by John Lord. Mm -hmm. who we've said 
is or was the keyboard player in Deep Purple and a founding member of Deep Purple. So for anyone not familiar, I have to say this quickly. First of all, if you're not familiar with Deep Purple, you really should be. Anyone who's listening to this podcast and doesn't know who Deep Purple are, pause this podcast. Go listen to Deep Purple. They are much more interesting than what I'm talking about. Go listen to Deep Purple. It's good for you. But Deep Purple were a British rock band formed in sort of the late 60s, very prominent in the 70s. They're still gigging officially. They're still going about and doing yeah. their stuff, but um, very famous band. They've had a lot of different lineups over the years. Um, I think their most famous lineup would probably be like, they had like the Mark 1, Mark 2, Mark 3, Mark 4, what they call their different lineups. The most famous one is obviously John Lord, uh, Richie Blackmore, mm-hmm. which a lot of people I'm sure will have heard of, um, guitar player, also played with Rainbow afterwards. Then there's yeah. Ian Pace on drums, Ian Gillen on vocals, and Roger Roger Glover on bass. There yes. we are. I got that one. Right. So yeah. John I, Lord. I think those oh, sorry, are all the guys, those are all the guys that played on that concerto for rock. Uh, we were talking about yeah. yeah. So John Lord then obviously did train classically and went into mm-hmm. that. So can we talk about John Lord then? Let's talk about the composer before we get into the concerto. Tell me yeah. a little bit about him. So he kind of grew up in that in that generation, the post war generation mm-hmm. where they were too young to fight in world war ii and so they're kind of growing up in london post-war trying to rebuild mm-hmm. and they and he was taking piano lessons as a as a kid and he had a great teacher that taught him classical piano but also highly encouraged improvisation and just making making his own pieces so he started composing yeah. really really young and he was I mean, he was of the other generations of those 60s British rock bands where they were trying to find something that felt like a little rebellious because the BBC basically had, uh, they they would not allow anything on airwaves that was not like pre-approved and good for families. And so he was seeking out rock and roll wherever he could find it Um, Just and ended up running into all the other young men that were doing the same thing. Yeah. So he ended up forming a band, uh, multiple bands, and he was really kind of into improvisation at that point. Like he was Mm -hmm. trying to just make stuff up. And what he was most well known for, because he wanted to be the keyboard player in bands, um, he eventually basically had his keyboard uh, amp and he like destroyed the amp to create distortion (laughs) in his keyboard. So he would like hammer nails and stuff and make holes in the amp. liberally destroyed it. Yeah, yeah. Because he was trying to figure out how to make distortion on a keyboard. Okay. Which no one had done really up to that point? Yeah, yeah. He was one of the first to do that because they didn't didn't have the pedals for the keyboard like they do for guitar. Yeah. So he was going around. If you're in a rock band trying to compete with an electric guitar and a bass and drums, you need a bit bit of oomph in that. Yeah. Yeah. And so he and the other guys from the original lineup of Deep Purple. We started recording and finding success and traveling the world. And so that was how he was known. And all the while, he was still kind of interested in composing for other instruments. And Mm -hmm. he mentioned to their management in 1968, 1967, 68, you know, it would be really cool to write a piece of music for like a rock band plus an orchestra. And he didn't think anything would come of it because the management is trying to get them to make money as a rock band. Yeah. And instead they were like, all right, we'll book it. And they like booked the orchestra and a hall on a date. And they were like, okay, write it. <laughs> also, and, but can I just say not just an orchestra and a hall, the Royal Albert Hall and the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, like yes. possibly the best orchestra in Britain at the time. And the Royal Albert Hall is, you know, the Royal Albert Hall. Yeah. And Malcolm is, Arnold. Oh Malcolm yeah. Arnold who, was conducting it. Yeah. Who also yeah. wrote two flute concertos did he or one flute definitely wrote one flute concerto didn't he i at least one yeah yeah i feel like maybe there's another piece i played something there might anyway yeah so concerto for group tell me about that this is so cool i know about it but i want you to tell me (laughs) yeah oh it is so cool so he john lord had written like kind of 15 ish pages or something and he was thinking i'm gonna make this like a one movement thing that's going to be like 15 minutes long and he met up with malcolm arnold and showed him what he was writing and malcolm arnold was so impressed he's like no full concerto three movements you have to write it this is amazing and so that's what he did he wrote this three movement concerto for rock band and orchestra to be premiered by royal philharmonic at royal albert hall and they 
we're doing rehearsals with the orchestra and this is this is my favorite thing reading i, I actually have to i'm gonna have to find the quote because this is hilarious so they're doing these rehearsals it probably is the quote i pick it up yeah it probably is yeah <laughs> So yeah, they're doing rehearsals. <laughs> the, yeah, the orchestra is so mad. They, they don't like doing it. Um, I think one of the quotes is that um, one, yeah, of, one the of the people... cello players or something was really upset about it, weren't they? Yeah, they called them like a second rate Beatles second rate or Beatles, something like that. Which is, to be fair, everyone's second rate compared to the Beatles. But anyway, <laughs> that's unfair. I know the quote you're going to say because I was reading yeah. the quote and thinking, can I say that? And I was like, it's my podcast. Yeah. I can say it. So if you want me it's to a, say it, I can say it. You can say it as well. It's a quote, so I could say it. It's a quote. Yeah, it's, yeah, I'm not it is. We could beep it out, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I will but, beep it. So, Do you know what? This will be the first time I'm going to edit in a beep in my entire life. I'm going to beep this just right. to try to test my the... skills and also to spare I my grandmother. I'm going to be the first beep. Yes. We are, yeah, because <laughs> there's one word in this podcast I can't say. Yeah. And I've done it twice. An American just like kneels on a chalkboard to them and my grandmother hates me saying it. So this is the oh, one no. time I'm going to do a beep. But you can well, go this, ahead. <laughs> this is a quote. So Malcolm Arnold got really upset at the orchestra because they were in, insulted that they had to play with a rock band. And Malcolm Arnold got really upset and he quote said, you're supposed to be the finest orchestra in Britain and you're playing like a bunch of <laughs> <end quote. laughs> which is which is great it is great yes legitimately like hilarious and so they they calmed down they did their job the piece went off without a hitch um, I think at one point uh, Richie Blackmore might have taken too long for a guitar solo but oh I already I took a little bit longer than too long. I heard he took a long time for one of the guitars. I think they had pre-agreed that he'd do like a 90 second guitar solo and he went mm -hmm. on for quite a few minutes and the orchestra a bit like, is there any chance? And then he finally brought them in. But man, if Richie Blackmore's doing a guitar solo, you don't interrupt him. Leave no, him be. You just, All right. yeah, you just let it happen yeah, and you enjoy you're lucky it. to be in the presence of Richie Blackmore doing a solo. Exactly. Just sit down and enjoy. Exactly. But very cool piece. I, hadn't, I haven't heard the piece properly. Although you were saying there is a video of that performance. Yeah. It's on YouTube. There's a video of the, that whole performance. It's like almost an hour long. So I'll, I'll send that, that over to you so you can watch yeah. it. It's, it's so awesome. It's just so neat to see that, you know, see the audience that they brought in. Orchestras yeah. are always talking about trying to bring in new audiences. And it's like right, right there, right there's yeah. a visual of them bringing in a new audience. Yeah, because you can also, there's, there's a difference between diluting down both music forms to make some kind of fusion thing. Or you can just get the best of the best in both fields, stick them together and hope it works. So if you've got Deep Purple, Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, it's win, win, yeah. win, win, win. It's great. Yeah. It's it's kind of, so, it makes me a little I nervous now. Like, also, oh, no, I was just saying like when you watch the video, you can see John Lord's face sometimes and you can just see that he's like, I hope this goes well. What? <laughs> Which, like, it blows my mind. I'm like, man, you're John Lord. Forget what these classical musicians think. You're a rock star. You famously yeah. rock stars don't give a shit. You just go and do it. But it's nice to know that even they get nervous sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's class. Also, on Deep Purple's note, like, I'm going to do that. I think I might do it tonight. I think I have a night off tonight. I was going to go to the cinema and see Dune 2, but I might not do that. And I might stay at home and watch this concerto for orchestra. Deep Purple are one of those bands that I will sometimes really jump into. But I feel like Deep Purple's an evening. You know, I'll pour myself a glass of wine. Yeah, uh, and I think it's fair to say, not that I would indulge in such things, but I think Deep Purple are known for maybe other substances to enjoy their music. But yeah, it's yeah. still a rock. Yeah, they, they are. are class. Absolutely. They are class. They're great. To be fair, Deep Purple, <laughs> Deep Purple, and the Devil's Lettuce go hand in hand. So they but do. Not that not that I promote any such things on this podcast. But anyway, that'll be mine. So <laughs> I'm divulging. Uh, concerto for group and orchestra. So that's like John Lord's first proper time merging classical music. And he writes incredibly well for orchestra yeah. and rock music. Where do we go from here? This is 1969. 1969. Um, yeah. That piece was performed, I think, only three more times. And then they they lost the music. Yeah, I saw this. Yeah. Like, he thinks someone yeah. like didn't. I think the last gig was in L.A. And he mm -hmm. thinks someone just forgot to pick up the score. Yeah. Which means yeah. it must be somewhere as well. Like it can't have just disappeared. Somebody, it's got to be somewhere. But uh, yeah, so it was like 30 years before it was performed again. And uh, they wanted to do, someone wanted to do like a 30 year anniversary thing. And they didn't, they didn't have the music anymore. And so I think it was a master's student somewhere wanted to listen to the recording and just transcribe it mm. to recreate it. And so that's how they kind of recreated it. But that original score that they originally played is lost. 
Oh, if so anyone we... knows where it is, I would love to find that. That'd be so cool. Yeah. yeah, I heard that the master student apparently just rocked up one day in London when the rehearsals were happening. It was like, oh, yeah, here. I've just done the entire score for you. There you are, mate. Yeah. Great. I can't imagine that amount of transcription. Like, just what I had to do to, like, get some of his solos <sighs> down on paper when I was working on this project. Yeah. I'm like... Oh, it's a nightmare. I hate transcription. <gasps> I hate it's it. It's so hard. So yeah, okay, so 1969, we're out there. Uh, for reference point for anyone who is a Deep Purple fan, uh, Machine Head, which is their best album, came out in 1972. So we are at like no, almost peak Deep Purple. They took a bit of a turn in 72. Machine Head was kind of them going a little bit heavier, going that direction. Mm-hmm. We're at the same kind of era as Led Zeppelin coming out of the Beatles. So this is where we are in time. Uh, so John Lord's done that and obviously continued to compose. Can we go forward now to some kind of introduction to this piece we're talking about today yeah so he was composing kind of background but for a couple of decades he was mainly just playing in deep purple and he ended up retiring from deep purple in 2002 because he was really being drawn to more classical composition Mm -hmm. and didn't really want to i mean at that point how old is he you know he didn't really want to tour anymore yeah so he kind of retired 2002 bought a house um I can't exact. I can't remember exactly where he bought this house, but in that neighborhood was the writer John Mortimer, and they ended mm. up being basically neighbors, and they became really, really good friends. So John Mortimer, Sorry, can you tell us about? Yeah, can you tell us a little bit about yeah. John Mortimer then? So um, his daughter is Emily Mortimer, and she is still an actress. She, yeah, can she I was say, recently actually... in Mary Poppins Two. Yeah, she was, and oh, right, I, I find this great link as well. So Emily Mortimer is in. I think she's in one of the Scream movies is where I recognized her from. Oh. Maybe Scream 2 or Scream 3, like earlier on. But, so I find this, because I was, I, I, this whole topic, by the way, since you've sent me your thesis, I have been down so many rabbit holes on Wikipedia for <laughs> way too long. And this is so much fun. <laughs> anyway, so I went down this, find Emily Mortimer, because everyone said, oh, John Mortimer, he had a famous daughter who's an actress. So I find Emily Mortimer, and then I find she did a film called Love's Labour's rest i think it is it's like a rom-com like 2000 british rom-com very popular at the time but the co-star of that was a guy called alessandro nivola american actress who famously played gavin harris in the gold movies when he played for real madrid and newcastle football movies which made my day just find out that i could link wow. a flute concerto to gavin harris in real madrid and gold one sorry go that's ahead that's amazing that's <laughs> amazing wanted, that's where that's where i was last night at three o'clock in the morning so <laughs> Anyway, continue, so please. When I, when I was doing this research, I was, I think, either... I was probably re-watching the show 30 Rock with Tina Fey. And mm. in one of the first seasons, was first season or second season, Emily Mortimer is in it. And she plays... Ah. Um, she plays Alex Baldwin's girlfriend. And she has hollow bones. And she's always like, don't touch me. I have hollow bones. Ah, yes. <laughs> oh, that's Emily Mortimer as well. There we are. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so... Yeah, it opens so many rabbit holes, but John Mortimer was a a barrister, so a lawyer Mm -hmm. for us here in America. Yeah. And he argued in the 60s, he was arguing for freedom of speech. Um, Mm -hmm. So he was a part of the the big, like, uh, people were talking about what is pornography, and he was basically, Mm -hmm. like, trying to say, well, you can't, if you can't define it, you can't really restrict it. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and so he was really uh, in- integral to like allowing more free speech in magazines and newspapers and yeah. music and and all of that. So he was part of that. And then later he started. He's been, he'd been writing his whole life. But he started writing more later in his mm. life, and he wrote a TV show called Rumple of the Bailey, which was about mm. a barrister. Yeah, which apparently was super popular um, on BBC. It was. Yeah, like even yeah. I sort of remember that show. Like Rumpel okay. of the Bailey was like, I think for any British listeners, they'll definitely have heard of it. Horace Rumpel was the main character. It was like a mm-hmm. drama. It was like a courtroom drama. But yeah. it was, it's very gold TV. We have a channel in the UK called Gold and it's that kind of, it'd still be shown. It was like 80s, kind of 70s, yeah. 80s, 90s. It ran very like Only Foes and Horses kind of time that era. Not a bad mm-hmm. show to be fair. Actually a very famous show, just I'm not a big courtroom drama guy. But yeah. Yeah. And so he wrote, he wrote some books. He wrote, I have a couple of his like autobiographies. He's, he's a really mm. interesting writer to read. Um, but he and John Lord happened to become really amazing friends and just because they were neighbors. And mm. I think towards the end of John Mortimer's life, he started doing a one man show and he wanted some music to kind of go along with the show. And so he asked Lord if he would come write some music and then perform it. 
Mm -hmm. at the show so he did like introductions and some interludes and stuff for this one man show where john mortimer talks about his life and it was very very popular the show went ran for a pretty long time and those little pieces those interludes are actually what became the basis for this concerto Mm -hmm. yeah so we're talking still like now we're talking like early 2000s kind of time late 90s early 2000s yeah yeah early 2000s i I don't remember exactly what year John Mortimer died. I think John Lord died in 2012. I think it's 2012. Yeah, there were a couple of years apart with death, I think, anyway. Yeah, yeah. But I think so John, John Mortimer, Mortimer died. First. Yeah, he died first. And then um, not long after his death, an uh, yeah. orchestra came to John Lord and was like, would you write something for this festival? I think it was the Shipley Music Festival. Yeah. And he was like, well, I, maybe I will write something about John Mortimer because he had just lost him a few months ago and he thought that the flute was like the best sound for John Mortimer's voice like it just sounded like his voice yeah. I guess and so he took these pieces that he had already written for the show and kind of weaved them into other new stuff and created this big flute and piano concerto and mm. it basically the whole concerto tracks John Mortimer's life it's like begins with him as a young man um goes through his as he ages it deals with um his death at the end like he kind of knew the end was coming so we have this kind of uh very soft and kind of somber ending but mm. also ending with a bit of hope um yeah. because it was kind of it was it was a way for John Lord to kind of uh, deal with the grief that he was feeling over yeah. losing his friend yeah it is a by the way it is a gorgeous piece for anyone that hasn't heard it i will obviously put a link in the description for a recording of this but it is a gorgeous piece of music so it's in six movements and each movement mm-hmm. yeah has like a specific period of john mortimer's life and john Lord sort of yeah uses the music to describe that period of life although it's not always what you'd think it'd be like there's i think there's one movement where it's the fifth movement. No, the fifth movement is one with the big cadenza. The fourth movement. I mean, one of them is meant to be where he's quite sick, but yeah. it's very happy music and it's very upbeat. And you're like, ah, okay. Um, I think I think that might be the stick dance movement. Yeah, that's the one. Which I, yeah. I always found hilarious. So John Mortimer was kind of well known for being a flirt. And he, towards the end of his life, had to use canes to kind of help him move around. And so he would still like use his canes to get up out of a wheelchair and wanting to dance with pretty young women. And so he called it, John Lord called it the stick dance because he was like using his canes <laughs> awkwardly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so let's talk about the concerto itself. So six movements. Mm-hmm. I've got the list of the movements just here because there is a recording, I should tell people as well, yeah. the recording that is on Spotify, which you've just told me now is the only one, is by the Liverpool, Royal Liverpool Philharmonic. The flute mm-hmm. player is Cormac Henry, an Irish guy, actually, who's playing with Liverpool for quite a while. I've never actually had the pleasure of meeting Cormac yet, but I will definitely send him a link to this because he's a great player. Gorgeous yes. sound. Liverpool have always had a bit of a tradition of having Irish flute players in the orchestra too, obviously being so close to Ireland, the big Irish city. But anyway, Liverpool Philharmonic, um, Cormac Henry plays the flute and it's conducted by Clark Rundle. Um, mm-hmm. It is on Spotify, and there's a couple of extra pieces at the end. It's not just the concerto, first six tracks, the six movements, and then there's a couple of extra ones. Um, so, yeah, how would you describe the concerto for someone who has no idea what kind of... Because like, obviously modern composers can be anything from atonal serialism to film music. So what would you describe the general character and style of the composition? I would just... It's tonal. It's definitely tonal, and yeah. I like to think of it as kind of cinematic. Yeah, I got that vibe big time. Yeah, because when I, especially when you listen to that first movement, I I start thinking about Lord of the Rings type music. Like it, yeah. it has the same type of feeling. Yeah, as very if you rich were as well. Yeah, yeah, very colorful. Um, yes, very colorful, rich, and just it, it it's very easily paints a picture in your mind yeah. of of what's going to be happening. You don't have to like. It's not so, you know distant that you can't like have some sort of image if you read what the title is you listen to it you're like okay i can picture that yeah you can draw the two lines together yeah i find that as well yeah. apart from that one movement the stick dance i didn't quite get that but yeah now that you've explained it i'm getting it a little bit better um see so yeah, i'll go through the quick six movements um i've got the yeah. list of the titles and then yeah we'll talk about that so the first one is as i walked out one evening that's movement one mm-hmm. now what's that about do you remember that one is a, a young John Mortimer, and I think so. John Lord was trying to kind of depict him as a young man, um, hmm. 
walking through a city and i think i have a quote it's he imagined him as a pre-barrister john before he became a lawyer oh. he saunters through a summer evening in the city life spreads before him the girls are pretty the sun is warm and all seems right with the world that's not bad at all that's not bad yeah. at all yeah i also yeah. read the mortimer slight sidetrack but i think he went to i think he went to harrow the really famous school in england yes he was and yeah, he did. did he go to oxford as well for a little while um i think so but then he was did he get kicked out for being gay or kicked out for writing a romantic letter to a fella or something that was interpreted as being romantic i think i read and they were both thrown out. he wasn't yeah. gay but yeah it was like it had yeah. romantic undertones in a letter he wrote to a fella but yeah yeah so we're talking about this kind of era then yeah, mm -hmm. apparently he was a really fun guy as well um okay second movement is at court obviously mortimer was a barrister so that's kind of self-explanatory but you want to tell us anything about that yeah so this was kind of a, a movement that has a play on the word court so it is it does talk about him that's right yeah yeah it is yeah. basically about him as a barrister because he's he's really witty very quick and so he could kind of talk circles around people but he also was a bit of a womanizer and yeah. was often courting many women so he kind of used this as a little uh play on that word yeah um and there's a a theme in there the the really really beautiful theme that happens when it slows down a little bit um john lord referred to it as sir john in love ah that is beautiful yeah um yeah. what did i also read didn't you use a bit of i say i read it i read it in your thesis but um isn't there a little bit of the third band of Burke and shadow there was like a little hint of that or yeah was... yeah so uh john mortimer always described that it's like brandenburg number three he thought sounded like london music to him yeah and yeah. and john lord had often used his knowledge of bach to help him improvise and so mm -hmm. it was kind of like a natural thing to kind of add a little bit of quote from brandenburg in there um yeah. some of it is played in the flute and some of it is is in the piano yeah do you know what's so funny about that though because i just sort of put two and two together when Richie Blackmore left Deep Purple and he founded Rainbow, they used a lot of classical music in their stuff, and they often did Brandenburg Three as well. Actually, mm -hmm. uh, Blackmore used to play it as an interlude entirely on the guitar. And I'm wondering, did they ever? Is there a link there? Or is that just pure coincidence that both people from Deep Purple ended up using the third Brandenburg? I think there's probably a link there, but I think there must also, be. and. I would love to do more research on this. I think most of the rock stars of these 1960s, 1970s supergroups knew Baroque music. Because yeah, if you listen to those yeah. solos, it's just like, that is a Baroque sequence. <laughs> There's gorgeous ones, yeah. I think yeah. one of the first bands to do it was, uh, the Beatles did it on, uh, oh, what do you call it? Is it All My Life? There are places I mean. Yeah, All My Life. And there's a harpsichord solo in the middle. Mm, and it was played by yeah. i think it was played by the beatles manager and he did that and it's very baroque and then that sort of opened the door a lot of bands went oh what's that and let's stick some of them in and that became a big thing and then all those 70s bands they loved putting in baroque so zeppelin did a lot of it oh, as yeah. well they loved all this like um like english countryside renaissance -y kind of feelings they use a lot of flutes mm -hmm. and stuff and oh it's great i love that yeah we go back eddie to van halen solos yeah eddie van halen yeah. always using baroque music yeah. like it's, it's great it's it works so well in a guitar solo i love it yeah do you have any idea it's totally off topic we'll go back why do americans say baroque and why do we say baroque is there a reason why you guys say baroque i no i don't idea. know if i'm i have no idea i'm sure there yeah. is a reason i don't know i'm so curious about that i've never understood that maybe is you guys it, are right. is it like in europe in general they say baroque or yeah, is it baroque. like okay okay interesting in french it's baroque yeah it's always that yeah and then American say Baroque, and I was like, ooh. Anyway, that's a, if anyone knows the answer to that, they can reach out to me. I'm sure there is an answer. There was something I like would, that as well. I would well. also love to know the answer. <laughs> oh, yeah, flutist and flautist. Or, yeah, there's flutist, flautist debate, but then Americans say flautist, which is even third degree out there. Yeah, I don't I don't understand that one. Which I get one do you asked say? all the time. I say flutist. Yeah, nice. Me too, yeah. 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 I get asked, do you prefer flutist or flautist? I'm like, I don't play a flout. So. I, that's a classic one yeah i think do you know who was the first person to say that i'm nearly sure on this i might be wrong but i think it was jimmy jimmy galway did it in an oh. interview for the belfast telegraph i'm nearly sure that's where it first came from he was the first person okay. to do that so big up jimmy yeah i say flutist yeah. i don't like flautist although i asked a friend of mine tomaz he did a like an interview for a strad copy on instagram and they had asked him he said the difference between flutist and flautist is a flautist gets paid more which <laughs> i saw that kind of like the idea though <laughs> 
So shout out to Tomasi, Steffi, listen, that was actually really yeah. funny. So in maybe, that case, maybe I, I am should... a flutist. <laughs> I should strive to be a flautist. Yeah, me too, because... Uh, <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. Okay, so that's the second movement. Third movement, Turtle yeah. Heath. Tell us about that. So this is basically the house where John Mortimer grew up, and mm-hmm. he had... Uh, his parents had gardens. I think his father really loved to garden, and so had yeah. this beautiful garden with it, and it was just a couple miles from where John Lord and his wife lived, and so they were there quite often walking yeah. through the gardens with John Mortimer. And so it, this, uh, this movement is really just kind of a depiction of him a little bit older, just enjoying the home yeah. where he grew up in. Yeah. Yep. And for anyone who wants to know, I didn't know this either. Turville Heath is somewhere between like Reading and Watford direction in England. Also on John Mortimer's dad, I read a thing. So he was an actual barrister as well. Like apparently quite a well-known one, but there was something I read where he was getting out of a car, I think. And he hit his head on the roof and detached the retinas in both his eyes and went blind. Yeah. Yeah. And that was it. And I was like, man, that's a new fear unlocked that I didn't know I have. You hit your head and both your eyeballs fall out. What the fuck? How does that happen? I was like, man, you can that's go blind horrifying. just by hitting your head to both of them. And then apparently yeah. for the rest of his life, his wife looked after him, like did his transcripts in court, fed him, bathed him, everything. Yeah. But they never talked about it. They just pretend like yeah. it was normal and went on. I was like, man, that is so English. I was <laughs> going to say, that stiff seems... upper lip. That like seems pretty English. Oh, yeah, we're not going to talk anyway. about the fact that there's an issue. <laughs> no, no, but here, just push it all down there. And yeah, then exactly. Drop dead of a heart attack at 44 in the street. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> right. Uh, fourth movement, stick dance. Right, go through stick dance. We told I told us a little bit about it anyway, but. Yes. Yeah, and so stick dance is just him a little bit older. He's having some mobility. He had a, issues. He had a walking stick. And so this, it was, let's see. So Lord, this is John Lord's description of it. He said he had. John Mortimer had loved dancing, but of course, by then he couldn't. So he would kind of stand there with his stick in one hand and then the other would be the hand of a young woman who was doing all the jiving. Yeah. And he was standing there enjoying the view. The piece tries to conjure up that vision. And at the end of it, of course, he gets a little out of breath from just standing there and has to sit down. So can relate to that. (laughs) (laughs) No. Yeah. (laughs) Great. Actually, to be fair, it is. I think it's one of my favorite movements. I love the stick because it is so energetic and it's nice as well to have a concerto where obviously the classic concerto structure fast slow fast is great but it's nice that it sort of goes like that with the six movements yeah. it, and the, the movements aren't that long either they're like five six minutes each and it just yes. freshens up and the stick dance kind of comes out of nowhere and it is great and it's well placed yeah. for the next movement as well one of those first those first runs in stick dance i think goes up to like a high d and you're supposed mm. to flutter tongue on it or something and i was yeah. like why <laughs> yeah yeah because it's like a high d is in like the one like fucking up there yeah yeah i was listening to it and i thought it gave me a little bit of a feeling of eber the eber concerto mm-hmm. as well just like how wild it is and how screechy and how like wow it, and the harmonies weren't a million miles off i don't know what key it's in but it sounded like it was in like lots of flats and lots of that kind of like rah, kind of thing yeah it was great yeah. though i loved it um and then yeah. i think what i like the most about the movement is it's perfectly placed one into the, the fifth movement is the best i think i don't think I don't know. For yeah. me, like it's pretty obvious. It's the, it's the even on Spotify, it's got like way more hits than everything else. Everyone mm-hmm. knows the fifth movement is a special one. So, fifth movement, uh, winter of a dormouse. Tell us about that. Yes. So, um, this one actually came from. I think the the title came from one of his books. Yeah, I have one of his books here. So, um, John Mortimer wrote a book called The Summer of a Dormouse, and it was kind of about a part of his life. Uh, he wrote a couple different autobiographies throughout his life um and so in one of one of mortimer's favorite quotes are from lord byron and in his journals byron wrote when one subtracts from life infancy which is vegetation sleep eating and swilling buttoning and unbuttoning how much remains of downright existence the summer of a dormouse so yeah so the winter of the dormouse was is basically um this is when John Mortimer is kind of realizing he's at the end of his life. Mm. So you have a bit of this kind of uh, sadness at the beginning. Um, This kind of is beautiful, but it's very melancholy. And then you have this cadenza right in the middle towards the end of it. And the cadenza is just like absolute. It's, it's just, it's so intense and it's just him raging. And it also goes along um, 
in the score there are actually quotes from the dylan thomas poem do not go yeah. gentle into that good night so that's kind of written in so each little segment of this cadenza has a piece of that of that poem what do you think the purpose and, of that is is that the like is it a performance direction nearly to sort of put those quotes in or is it just to give an yes. image or okay i think it's i think it's a bit of both i think it's performance direction because i think um john mortimer was reading that poem a lot towards the end of his life and so you're trying to depict someone kind of angry at the fact that they know it's the end mm. and so you really want to kind of put that into the performance of the cadenza but also at the very end of the cadenza we have this kind of acceptance and so yeah. it ends really really softly like okay i love you know, the I've, i have done yeah i have done i've lived a great life i have done everything i can go i can go yeah and it's all okay it is a beautiful movement it really is and the very ending it's one of those ones that uh, it goes straight into the next movement. It's sort of held on like a very, it must be like a, a dominant seventh quarter or something like that. Like you can feel it wants to go to the next note and then the piano mm -hmm. brings in the last movement and it's just beautifully set down. It is gorgeous. It's very cinematic, but it is absolutely beautiful. Um, by far my favorite movement. If I was recommend anyone pick the single movement from this, I'd go for that one. Because yeah. of the flute cadenza, I don't know how much freedom is actually written into the score of the cadenza, but... Cormac does an amazing job of it. Like it is proper because yeah. it is technically a hard piece of music. Well, it sounds hard. I don't. It I haven't is, seen the notes, it but it sounds hard. It is very hard. Yes, and yeah. it's it's so intense too. Like you have to you mm. have to basically figure out where is the most intense point and how can I go a little bit farther. And then yeah, knock it up. Yeah, oh. yeah. Mm -hmm. So fair play to Cormac for doing such a good job on that. And then mm -hmm. yeah, it drops into the last movement uh, called afterwards do you want to tell us about that i think this movement is is more john lord this is him accepting yeah. that his friend has has passed away um and there are two versions of this there's the one with no words and then on the album there's one with the ah. with a poem that goes along with it someone reads a poem with it yes yeah i saw that in the so album it should as well be, yeah. yeah it should be the same music but there's, there's just yeah, the two versions the of it and so um, this is also a Thomas Hardy poem. The poem is afterwards and Mortimer would read it at the end of all of his one man shows. Yeah. And so that's why John Lord put it at the end of this, this piece. Yeah. And so it, it, it begins with the solo piano, which is John Lord's voice throughout this whole thing. Yeah. So it's him talking about his friend and about his feelings about his friend. And then what I really love about this, the last movement ends or the fifth movement ends with this, really beautiful little melody yeah and it comes back at the very end of the sixth movement as yeah. well and i i just think that 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 particular melody is what john mortimer is saying is acceptance like i've accepted yeah. that this is the end and it's okay and then his voice just comes back a little bit at the end of the very sixth yeah. sixth movement telling john lord it's okay yeah Everything it is, is fine. so pretty it is yeah. such a nice piece of music like i genuinely cannot recommend this piece enough just because it's so gorgeous like when i went and listened i was like oh man this is fucking great so it is a beautiful ending and i think understanding these aspects of the piece make it much more relatable it isn't a very mm -hmm. emotive piece of music it's very clear about what its intentions are emotionally and it's oh superb yeah so that is beautiful. yeah that's the structure of the concerto obviously yeah, yeah so there is only one recording not obviously but there is only one real recording them that's a shame yes wonder if anyone I, would fancy doing it i think that it's been played once in the U.S. I okay. think someone played it with the Rochester Philharmonic in New York. Ah, okay. Uh, it was it was a few years ago, um, but other than that, it just it hasn't got much play. There is a piano reduction that I have. I don't know if ah. it's in print, um, but I basically when you write a dissertation like this, if something is under copyright, you have to like purchase from that publisher the rights yep. to like be able to use the music in your dissertation and stuff like that. So. I was given the scores to use for that, but I can't use it for anything else. Yeah. So I just have them. <laughs> Has the, do, have the scores ever been in print? No. Well, they must have been in print for the Persian Planet in the recording, but. I I would think so, but they're, I don't know if maybe they're harder to come by in the United States than they are in I would Europe. Say but so maybe... I know the publisher was shot, shot publishing. So I, <laughs> I would think. 
I thought you meant no. the publisher was shot. <laughs> I was like, what happened no, to S- him? What did he do? S C H O T T. Yeah, oh, shot man. publishing. <laughs> yeah, I was like, why? What did he do? <laughs> I was like, I'm not playing this piece of people getting hey, shot over it. I'm not touching hey, it. Hey, you visit the United States, you know. It's. <laughs> yeah. I think it was a oh, red dot coming over across I'm not allowed to be political. No, no, well, no, not in this podcast. We would never do something political no. in this podcast. No. <laughs> uh, oh man, that was so funny. Um, honestly, I have listened to this concerto a few times now. It's becoming one of those pieces I would love to play. Like, if, yes. if I could play any concerto, it's in my like top three, definitely. Like, I would yes. do Ebert because of my ego, because I I just want to be able to play the Ebert concerto with an orchestra to say I've done it. But mm-hmm. I would definitely prefer to play this instead. The notice such things. It is gorgeous. Um, and it doesn't it really doesn't sacrifice like the technique the technique required to play it like there's some hard stuff in this yeah, piece I, yeah it is a legitimate piece of music i feel like sometimes people worry that these the style of more like cinematic music is going to be diluted down or it's going to be too easy yeah. or it's going to be too accessible i think in my head if i'm comparing it to something maybe not a million miles off in terms of character the corn gold violin concerto it's yeah. got that kind of vibe you know it's very cinematic very dramatic very beautifully written but also it stands on its own two feet as a genuine classical composition and not some yeah. kind of attempt to pander to two different audiences it is beautiful um so yeah. if anyone listens to it please make sure they reach out to us because it is a gorgeous piece of music uh, do you have anything else you want to say on the concerto or anything you want to mention about it obviously you're very passionate about it so if you want to go on a 10 minute rant about how great it is please feel free i mean it's it is great it's fantastic and i think I think more people should play it, even if you're just going to play pieces of it, movements of it. Yeah. Let's let's get let's get it so that we can purchase it in the United yeah. States. <laughs> okay, G- genuinely. Then, what do you think? The sort of how would we get that going? Like, how do you think people will listen to it? They can purchase. She said the piano reduction is available in the UK. That'll obviously come with the flute part. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I suppose more people buying it, more people being aware of it, might lift it up. Um, I think so. I think I think it's an awareness thing, and I it kind of comes down to what I think are kind of issues in the like higher education system in the Mm. U.S., where we we're still kind of pushing um, a specific canon of music that you have to learn in in higher ed, and I I don't. quite agree i think there are styles that you have to learn you have to learn how to play the different styles i don't think there are canon pieces that you have to learn especially in the flute yeah i think it's maybe a little bit different for other instruments but yeah yeah so if you want to learn kind of a modern style that is it does have really high technique standards that you have to be able to hit this piece fits into that yeah it really does so yeah, so you don't have to just go to the other 20th century concertos like Ebert or Nielsen. We we have other options. And I, I just getting the word out yeah. about it. I've, I've struggled to get the word out about it for years now. I've tried to apply such, to... I can't believe yeah. this. I've applied to present at, at festivals, uh, regional ones, national ones, and I've always been turned down. So, And I, I didn't really know if it was because other people haven't really heard of this piece. Is it just yeah. not as popular here? And I just kind of happened upon it. And, and I don't know, but every time I've talked to another flutist about it, they've been like, Oh my gosh, this is amazing. This is so exciting. Yeah. So hopefully more flutists yeah, I wonder will what it is. and it'll get played more. I really cannot think of a reason why it isn't played so much. Yeah. Um, Cause modern flute concertos are becoming a big thing. I suppose in Europe, it's very common. A lot of flute players are playing living composers, concertos a lot. Now it's becoming, cause there is such great ones. But maybe it's just caught in that little time scale where it's not quite new enough to be in that world. Maybe I think right. that might be part of it. Just if it was if it was composed like this year, for example, or two years ago, it probably would have got played more. But it was just before the contemporary music bug really took over, which I feel yeah. like Emmanuel Bayou did a lot for as well. But ten years ago, people weren't playing these concertos. Now they are, and he's this piece has just kind of slipped underneath, which is such yeah. a shame. And I yeah. I think there's also probably some. Some people that are like, well, he's he's a rock guy. It can't Wait it can't minute. possibly be that good. He's a he's a rock star. How is he oh, composing? Yeah. Like, I, I'm it's sure that opposite. mentality is still out there. Yeah, which... Matt, it's the opposite. If he's in Deep Purple, that is a that is a sign of quality. Okay, I understand the one argument about Deep Purple, which is Deep Purple people immediately think of Smoke in the Water, which is an incredibly annoying song because every guitar shop you go to in the world there's someone in the corner going darn 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 you're like oh god really and but, every every marching band in the united states plays it 
Really? Every single one. Yes, it is a oh. marching band anthem, and it's ridiculous. Oh. I'm like, Stop. I wonder how Richie Blackmore feels about that. That is not the deep purple. That is not no. the, the vibe they were looking for. Like they're oh. they're such an improvisatory band. Like if you listen to their live albums, like their songs go on forever because they're just like they're great. Yeah, like John Lord and Richie, they're like bouncing off of each other these amazing solos, and they're oh. taking what that person did and changing it. Like it's just the musicianship that, that, is that you can stunning. definitely hear the link as well. You can hear the link between that and his classical writing because the improvis- yes. improvisatory, improvisatory nature, yeah. tough to get out, um, is very clear. Also, Deep Purple, yeah, they've done like I think they've done like forty something live albums. A lot of their live performances are on YouTube. There's some great, like, full length ones. Genuinely, I can think of no better way for anyone to spend a Friday night than stick on, like, an hour long Deep Purple concert, pour yourself a glass of wine, turn the lights yeah. off, and just chill out. It is great. And then that'll That's be amazing. your gateway drug. And then you think, oh, maybe I'll stick on to notice such things. And then one thing leads yeah. to another. We're away. So maybe we'll start a revolution. Yes. That'll be it. We will. Um, <laughs> well, I do want to get on some fun questions. Although okay. this whole thing was fun. Okay. <laughs> I, I was met okay so i was telling you just before we started recording instagram is down at the minute unfortunately so i had sent you these questions over today but it wouldn't send instagram is down which as i was also saying i was i genuinely had a panic attack before coming on this podcast I was like oh my god they've that's it finally finally zuckerberg has shut me down he's got to me and he's like gareth you've done enough and he's blocked my account <laughs> and then i googled it and it turns out like half the world is having the same issue so yeah but you haven't got time to prepare for these questions which is a little it's bit okay. unfair but Thankfully, the first question is quite an easy one. Uh, what's your favorite flute concerto? <laughs> to notice <laughs> such things by John yeah. Lord. <laughs> yeah, I really should have took that one out. Yeah, that was we knew that one was going. Um, great. Uh, okay. I also, so, I also really enjoy the Reinecke. So. Ah, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. You can see the link with that as well. Reinecke is a very, it's a very romantic concerto as well. Yeah. Yeah. Good one. Um, okay. Do you remember the first album, flute album, you bought? So CD, vinyl, anything. I do. I had, Ooh. I had the William Bennett Bach Sonatas album. Mm. Was my first flute album. Yeah. I and remember. I, I think the cover was just like his flute, wasn't it? Or maybe as far as I had. I think it was like yeah, purple, and then like had his flute on it. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I remember listening to that all the time and then when i was yeah. older I don't, I don't remember what teacher told me this but she was like oh no one would ever play bach like that and i'm like i am okay <laughs> man don't even get me started on that people say that all the time but like well bennett yeah because obviously bennett and galway were good mates and they're similar styles similar mm-hmm. bennett was most known for his baroque recordings i think it's because people listen to the sound the actual tonal quality and go oh it's too heavy it's too much and there's yeah. vibrato and they go oh okay too much vibrato too heavy that's it instantly throw it out the window and you go well if you can get past that which was a period thing in the 70s and 80s if you move past that the actual structure phrasing stylistic nature is beautiful and it's very appropriate it's not very different from period performance it's just those yeah. two qualities which is like you know look into it a wee bit more yeah i actually i played in a master class for william bennett uh, mm. a few years ago now it was maybe a couple years before he passed and uh yeah. i played the bach partita for him oh i was oh i was so nervous to play like i grew up listening to his bach and now i have to play bach in front of him and i played it and he was he i'm gonna remember this to the day i die he was like that was beautiful i didn't expect someone to play box so well today and i was like there you are <laughs> put that in your cv put that straight in your know, cv right? get that frame put it on the wall exactly. yeah, i played for william bennett once i actually until you just said i totally forgot i played in the master class for william bennett until right now i think i played the ebay concerto for him actually oh i think i actually made the very weird decision as well as i prepared the back b minor sonata and then i was working on the ebay at the time the first movement for an audition and my teacher at the time because I was saying, like, it's not performance ready. Like, I can't go out in the, the first move of the e-bear like this. And he's like, yeah, but you're going to a master class. So you have, you have two options. You play the B minor, so you look good in the master class for everybody, but you don't really get much out of it. Or you bring the e-bear concerto the way it is, which is not quite performance ready, and genuinely get something out of it on how to continue with your studies and go forward and sort of forget about your ego. And I was like, do you know what? Yeah, that's a good idea. Because if I bring this now, that's where I need the input most. And it was great. He yeah. gave me so many tips on like where he would take from where I got with it in the couple of weeks I worked on it to where to go next. It was fucking great. And he was really nice about it. He wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. I, there you are. I love that mentality. I, that's kind of my mentality about master classes. Like you don't have to have it perfect. Like no. if you, if it's, if it's most of the way there, if you have a good idea of it, 
but yeah. they can like give you so much more like yes do that and i, I had a teacher that was like absolutely not you have to show up and like have perfection and i'm like that's a gig that's a gig yeah. what's the point in getting the master class in that's a gig that's exactly. a concert in you're not you've exactly. already made your mind up on musical things all as well there's no point use the master class. it's for you it's not for the teacher or the audience it's for you to get something out of it so yeah may as well now nah. I have the same opinion. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Okay. Next question. Do you remember the first album you got in general? So any kind of music. Um, I think it was Blink-182. Oh, yes. Good <laughs> I answer. know. I know you don't all, like All the small them. things. I, I yeah. do like Blink-182. I just don't like them in comparison to Sum 41. I think Sum 41 are much better. But I, I would probably agree with that. Yeah. I like I, I I Sum 41. Blink-182. That's a cool answer. I think I I also had uh, Lit the band Lit. Their album was one of my first ones. Yeah, I'm not familiar with them. I was I was really into like the the punk pop phase. Yeah, when I was a yeah, teenager. Man. yeah, me too. <laughs> I still am. I still haven't gone out of yeah. that man. The older I get, the more I keep listening to that music and not discover new music, which is terrible. <laughs> it's really bad because it's like, oh yeah, just go back to some forty one. Let's go back to. All American Rejects, let's just go into that again. Like, Garth, come yes. on, it's been 15 years. Maybe it's time to move on music. <laughs> never, uh, never. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> rock on, man. Okay, uh, if you could switch instruments, but be as good as you currently are on the flute, what would you switch to? Um, I th- I think I would like the sound of cello the most. Mm. I always, oh, cello's just so good. Uh, um, but I also am thinking... I would probably have more access to jobs if I were a double reed player. <laughs> True. Yeah. I always think that as well. Or double bass. You can play a couple yeah. of scales. You're in an orchestra. Easy. Yeah. So like maybe a maybe bassoon or oboe. Yeah. Like I'd have more yeah, access to get, some jobs. Yeah. yeah. yeah bassoon. Yeah. yeah. Easy. You get every job you want. That's mm-hmm. not a... I, sorry. I should apologize to all the bassoonists listening to this. I actually love the bassoon. Right. Um, what was the next one? Oh, yeah. If you could have any job outside of music, what would you do? If you couldn't do music at all in any any fashion. I think I would like to run a nonprofit that helps other people get access to cool. music. Because I don't I don't I don't know if there's anything else I could do That's with a my great life. Answer. Like I'm I'm just I I mean I was injured and so I literally had to give up playing for like three years. I couldn't play. Yeah. And so now it's just like I, I don't I can't do anything else yeah like I, I crawled back from an injury to yeah to do this professionally like this is it for me but yeah that's I, okay. I get very i get very frustrated about lack of access to music education um mm. i think it's a, a big problem in the united states because of the way that like school systems get funding yeah. so yeah. some schools get a lot of funding for music ed and their students get access yeah. and other schools get no funding yeah and i would just love to help more more students get funding. Like if we want, if we want orchestras, professional orchestras to be diverse and have yeah. a variety of people, like we got to get them when they're young. You do. Yeah. That's it. You got to get them at the start. Yeah. <laughs> that's a really good answer. Wow. Beautiful answer. Uh, okay. Two questions left. If you could have a drink with any musician alive or dead, who would it be? Oh, so I heard you ask this in the last episode and I was like, Oh, he might ask me this. I'm going to think about it. And I you kind of have to say John Lord, don't you? <laughs> I, I kind of, yeah, I should say John Lord, but actually yeah. <laughs> as I was thinking of Stravinsky and here's why. Ooh. When you look at the timeline of Igor Stravinsky's life, he was born in mm-hmm. like the 1880s and he died yeah. in 1971. Oh, fuck, and that's right. Yeah. The 70s. Like he, he was born before cars. <laughs> Yeah. Born before cars, died after we went to the moon. That's true, yeah. Never thought about it like that. Like, yeah. I just I want to talk to a person whose lifetime started with horses and buggies and trains, steam engines were there, but Yeah. And then cars and then there unfortunately the wars and we don't need to talk about that, but then oh, like oh. a shuttle to the moon? <laughs> Yeah, like Igor Stravinsky might have even heard the Beatles. He might have heard Deep Purple. I yeah. thought about that. That's insane. Yeah. When I think that Deep Purple were about the same time as Stravinsky. Yes. That was weird. Isn't that I never crazy? thought about that. Okay, that is it's a really crazy. good answer then, yeah. I think he lived in America as well, didn't he, at the end of his life? Yeah, yeah. He uh, I think born in maybe born in Moscow or near Moscow and then yeah. um 
he died in New York in I think 1971. No. That's insane. Yeah. That's mad. Yeah, so he okay, was really he was alive. Answer. He was alive when that concerto for group and orchestra premiered. Yeah, that's wild. Okay, that's a yeah. good answer. I never thought of that. Well done. Uh, okay, and the last I mean, question. I, well, the Go reason ahead. the reason I thought of that is I. I I used to teach a lot of music appreciation and I would always kind of bring oh. that up with students. Like imagine being born then. And when you die, we have gone to the moon and it's just that is mind insane. blowing for them. Music appreciation. Yeah. As soon as you said that, I inst- and something I've been thinking about a lot for the last few weeks because of this school of rock. There's that bit in the school of rock where Jack Black's like rock appreciation. And I'm thinking about that so much recently because of this as well. I, I'm going to do an episode of school amazing. of rock someday. I love I, that movie. I cannot tell you how much I adore that movie. I watch <laughs> it at least twice a year. Everything. I'll do an episode on it someday. I swear I love that. Okay, last question. Because I, I can't get me started in School of Rock. That is the last thing this episode needs. <laughs> we'll need a sequel. Um, so if you were with Stravinsky, what drink would you have? What's your favorite drink? Um, I like, I'm a wine drinker. I like wine. But my, my husband and I have both kind of quit drinking recently because we have reached the age where like one glass of wine makes my husband feel absolutely terrible (laughs) yeah yeah okay what's your favorite soft drink that or non-alcoholic drink um my coffee oh my god Mm. i drink so much coffee i shouldn't i should drink less coffee but i at least four shots of espresso every day is is what i drink (laughs) that is a lot of coffee to be fair yeah yeah it's too much i shouldn't do it but i i can't help it (laughs) Uh, and to be fair one thing i will say about america is you guys do get really good coffee in america I feel like Americans know what they're doing with coffee. Underrated oh country for coffee. I yes, except like Starbucks is now like we bought an espresso machine during the pandemic. So my my husband and I were lucky enough that we both had our jobs. We were teaching online. Yeah, our finances didn't change during the pandemic. So when the government sent us some money, we were like, okay, let's use some of it and like put it into the economy and so we bought an espresso machine <laughs> since we couldn't put it into the economy i'm going to use that justification for everything i do now <laughs> exactly so we have an espresso machine it is so good it is so good the only oh. place where the coffee is better than at my house has been any time we've been in europe oh okay. like we were in vienna last summer and it was just okay, like vienna is class oh, for coffee God, okay vienna is so obscene good. for coffee although i feel like vienna even for europe that's special that's it. I love Italian coffee. French coffee, I'm going to say this now, coffees in Paris, a little bit overrated because nearly 90% of it is Café Richard. It's good. It's like a solid coffee, but it's not like exceptional. But mm. then coffee in the UK, awful. Awful. <laughs> no. And coffee I in don't... Ireland, didn't even start no. me on that. No. I don't remember. I, I was in uh london once i've been out to the uk once and i don't remember a lot of it because i had a sinus infection at the time and i ah. felt terrible and i had to perform i had to perform there and i was like oh oh with a sinus awful. infection yeah it was awful it was awful so i don't remember a whole lot of that trip so i'm like i don't remember the coffee i remember we went for indian for food the best. though and indian food was it's pretty good indian food that's one okay i will give the brits that sorry the brits the english <laughs> I have to stop saying the Brits. That's my Irish and me coming. I'm like, yeah, the that's right. The English, um, they do do great Indian food. I will give them that. Well, not going into the reasons why they do great Indian food, but yeah. it is very good over it. <laughs> it is great. <laughs> great. Matt, I cannot believe we have talked for over an hour already. This is oh my- ridiculous. The wow. quickest podcast. It, it, genuine out of every guest I've ever done. I've never had an episode feed so quick. This oh, is great. I don't know um, if that's good or bad. That is definitely a compliment. <laughs> I could go on for another hour. Um <laughs> I dare say we might do another episode at some point. This might be, you might be my first recurring guest. I've never had a guest <gasps> come back twice, but I feel like we haven't got enough out of this. We've talked a lot about John Lord, which is great. Very happy about that. But I know there's other topics I want to talk to you about. So maybe you will be the first, yeah, recurring, returning guest, not returning. returning I guest. would be so honored. Be no one's so been roped into it. Yeah. And you're only the second, <laughs> yeah, you're only the second American. Yeah. I haven't had many Americans yeah. on this show. So that's, yeah, yeah. it's only you and Gary Shocker. And to be honest, I'm not planning for many others. So, oh my gosh. <laughs> sorry, Americans, like, if you're to be, you stop saying to be in a category with Gary Shocker, like, yeah. I need to stop amazing. saying that though, because, yeah, potential sponsors have been telling me that my influence in the American market is the reason they're reaching out to me. So I need to stop Ooh. attacking Americans on this podcast. Um, Don't. No. I love your Some, American sometimes, dollars. That's sometimes we deserve it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Oh, I'm going to get in so much trouble. I've already had my Instagram deleted now, this. Anyway, yeah. right. Um, <laughs> Before we go, last thing then, where can people find you? Where can people check you out? 
plug away. Where you go with the carpets, yeah, the floor's so yours. I am on Instagram at Brian Little Flutist. I'm on YouTube. I don't, you'll have to search me on there because I don't remember yeah. what my YouTube handle is. Uh, I'm Ooh. on TikTok. I think that's Brian Little Flutist as well. Uh, TikTok is uh, a lot of my dog though, and she's adorable. So, which is if you wanna... all the reason to go there. Yeah. 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 See, the other thing I wanted to talk to you about was your practice thing as well. Your practice yeah. series on YouTube. Oh, right. Next episode. Right. Anyway, sorry. Continue. Next episode. Uh, yeah, I, that anywhere is, else? That has been my obsession lately. Like as as an adult with a crazy schedule, like trying to practice appropriately. That's that is my thing. So if you're interested yeah. in that, come follow me on YouTube, and we'll talk. There about you are. It. That's a great plug. Actually, do go check that. Out. I think there is there three videos out for There's that. There's three now? episodes right now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so there you are. Go check it out. If you go on the our YouTube channel, you can type in. The, you'll see the video. They come up pretty straight. They were recommended to me when I go onto your channel. So easy. Yay. Great. And yeah, that's it then. Thank you so much for coming on. This was a lot of fun. It really was a lot yeah. of fun. I've really it enjoyed was. it. Thank and... you. Thank you for having me. This is great. Well, a pleasure. An absolute pleasure. So yeah, everybody go check it out. Check out everything. And do come back to one of us if you listen to the concerto. Please let us know what you think. Unless you think it's yes. bad and then don't bother. Just keep no, your opinions then to I yourself. Then I don't want to hear it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, we'll say goodbye to everybody and then we'll chat about it all fair. Uh, okay. Right then. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.